Okay, welcome back. So far we've seen a bunch of stuff about how to handle one sample of data. Okay, but oftentimes what we want to do is we've got two samples or two groups that we want to compare to each other to maybe compare treatments. Okay, so we're going to start talking about what if I have two samples and specifically here of quantitative or numerical data. What are we going to do with that? Alright, so we're going to try to apply all these ideas of inference. We know what inference is, point estimation, confidence intervals, all that stuff. We know of all about all these methods. And remember what we're doing is we're, we're moving down this list. Alright, so a single mu and a single p, right, these are, these are one sample situations. Okay, so we've, we've talked about these and these. If you haven't seen the previous videos yet, check those out. All right, now we're moving down our list to the mean of two what we would call dependent populations. This MP here, that stands for matched pairs. All right, so back previously, should add some exposure to experimental design. All right, and you may remember that a couple of our ways of collecting data one of these ideas is this matched pairs design, right? That's where we take two very similar individuals and maybe we give one a treatment, one is the control, or we give them separate treatments and kind of compare their results. All right, so that's one way. So here I would have two samples. I'm comparing them on a one-to-one -one basis. Independent samples, though, that's where there is no relationship between the two samples. Okay, so first we're going to deal with, with this case, right, where there is some sort of relationship between the samples and I can match people up on a one-to-one -one basis. Then we're going to talk about what if there is no relation? What if everything's completely randomized? Alright, so if these if we're doing match pairs and these two samples are not independent, we could we could call them dependent. And these people are matched up based on some important characteristic that we are interested in. Okay, when we pair people up, we want these people to be as alike as possible. It might even be the same person. Um, and we, but we do, so if we have two treatments that we're comparing, uh, we may give the person in the pair one, one treatment, the other person in the pair the second treatment, and we're going to randomize who gets what. Right, some common examples you may see of matched pairs before and after, pre and post test type situations, those are very common, very good matched pairs. Now those, are, But those are usually performed on the same person, right? I give you a pretest before the class, you, get, you take the class, you take the final exam, and we see how you did, how much you've learned, how much you've improved. Before and after, similar idea. Um, sometimes matched pairs examples, we're just finding two very similar people and matching them up. But that can be hard to do because people are so different. Um, one way to control for genetic factors, right, maybe you've seen a twin study. Okay, some kind of cool cool examples of those. Like that, uh, that astronaut guy that spent a year in space and then they compared him to his twin back on Earth to see how space affected him. Okay, so let's think about how this data would be laid out. So I'll have in pairs. So when we're when we're thinking about sample sizes for a matched pairs situation, right? We don't necessarily think about how many people are in the study. We think about how many pairs do I have, right? Because if there's a pair of people, I'd have n people here and n people here. That'd be two n total individuals. But when we when we're analyzing these, we treat our n as the number of pairs. Okay, so we say here's observation one from treatment one, here's observation one from treatment two, then find the difference. Right? And I do that difference for each pair. So then I end up with a row of differences. Or actually, a, I'm sorry, a column of differences. Alright, then we treat those differences as our sample. From there we can find the mean of our differences, x bar d, we can also find the standard deviation variance of our differences. Right? The standard deviation would just be the square root of this. 
Okay, so the idea, so at this point, right, we've taken both of these samples. I've taken number one, I've taken sample two, I've subtracted them, and it leaves me with the differences. So the idea here is we have two samples, but there's a relationship between the two. We calculate the difference, right, and then I basically treat those differences as if it were a single sample. So let's think about what the sampling distribution of the mean difference would look like. All right, so this is a mean, right? We know what the central limit theorem tells us to think about means, how means behave, right? Central limit theorem, t distribution, all this kind of stuff. So this is still a mean. It's the mean of these differences. It's a, a kind of a specific special mean, but it's still a mean, right? So it follows the the typical logic that we think about that we already have in place to do with means. Okay, so we know if the central limit theorem holds we can use z, but a couple things here. Number one, technically in order to use z we need to know the population standard deviation. Now when we're thinking about the population standard deviation here, or the sigma of these differences, that technically doesn't exist, right? There's, there's really no way we would know that. Okay, so we're probably not going to go no sigma, but we know still if we have large samples, we can usually get away with z. Now maybe you can get away with z for for match pairs, but really in practice, we're pretty much always going to use t for matched pairs. Okay, so we're thinking we're going to be using a t distribution for matched pairs. We want to apply these inference techniques. Let's start with confidence intervals. Okay, so how do I use all these ideas to make a confidence interval? We know the basic format of a confidence interval, point estimate, plus or minus, margin of error, margin of error is made up of, critical value times the standard error. Okay, so typically we're going to use the T. Alright, so just like we've constructed before, our point estimate of mu D is X bar D, T distribution, so T critical value, and we're using our standard error here. Now one more thing to notice here, of course after we build our confidence interval, if we're working with the T distribution, we know we got to deal with degrees of freedom. Okay, so how do we deal with degrees of freedom for matched pairs? Well again, remember our N deals with the number of pairs, the number of differences that we have, not the total number. So our degrees of freedom is the number of pairs, number of differences, minus. So what if we want to do a hypothesis test here for the mean difference? Well, we know the general format of our test statistic right, looks like this. Whatever we observe minus the mean over the standard error. Now normally we're going to be using T for matched pairs. All right, so we'll be observing values of X bar minus the mu, mu D, that's our parameter of interest, not, that's our claimed value over that standard error quantity and of course with degrees of freedom in D minus 1. Okay so let's talk a little more about this mu D naught. How do we define our hypotheses for the mean difference? All right well technically this this is our parameter of interest right mu D that's the mean difference okay, and most questions will be asked okay, is there a difference in these two groups? Is there some sort of effect? If I'm trying to show that there's an effect, right, remember my null, I have to assume there is no effect. So writing that in words would be that mu d is equal to zero. There is no difference. Now the alternative is where you state the effect that you're looking for. Okay, so the alternative again could be left-tailed, right-tailed, two-tailed, whatever. All right, once we've set up uh, a, our match pairs hypothesis, we do have to be careful setting it up, which we'll see in our example. All right, but once we've set it up, right, it's really not much difference from a normal one-sample t-test. Right, the setup, there's a little more thinking involved on the front end, right, but mechanically, it's, it's exactly the same as a one-sample t-test. So the first step here is, okay, I know I've got two samples of data going on, right? I have to decide our 
can I treat it as match pairs or are they independent? Okay, we really determine that by is there some sort of relationship here that I can establish some kind of one-to-one -one relationship, right? But if they're independent, now we haven't we haven't talked yet about how to deal with if they are independent, we can't do all this match pair stuff. Okay, so we'll see in the future how we deal with independence. All right, so thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.